Right. Thanks, Haley, for sharing. Um, okay, so welcome to old friends and hello to new friends. I'm Jen Taylor Friedman. I study scrolls and I teach scribes. And today we're going to be looking at the special tagging that you will come across in scrolls occasionally because I've had a bunch of questions from people lately. What is this? What do I do about it? So I thought I'd just be very efficient and teach everybody all at once. Um, if you have questions at any point, feel free to chime in. I don't have everybody's face on my screen, so waving at me won't help. Um, so voice chiming in is the best way to do this. So can people see my cursor? Yes. Yes. Okay, brilliant. Super. So here are some of the things that I've been asked about lately. So Hayes with curious tagging and irons, which are weird shapes. And this one over here, this Dalid with, with a fancy haircut. So what's the deal? And more particularly, what do you do about it when you find it in a scroll? So the course this is going to take is we're going to have a quick look at tagging in halacha. Then we're going to look at weird tagging in tefillin particularly. Um, what applies to tefillin mostly also applies to mezuzot. Then we're going to have a bit of a uh, trip back in time to look at some of the older variants of all these strange letters. Then, then there's a bit of a disconnect for <coughs> intermodality. And then I'll point you on to the sources to pursue this further, should you wish. Early letter halacha. So one of the questions that we get is, how can all these weird shapes be kosher? Because we learn from the Mishnah Brura and so on that you know, Shin has three tagging and that's the end of that. So then you come across hay with three tagging and people tend to freak out. So the earliest letter halacha, for instance, this bit here from the Talmud from Shabbat 103b, it doesn't really care about letter forms in anything like the way that modern halacha does. So the early bit says, Uchtav tam, that's a quote from the Torah, she take tiba tama, that you should have ketiba tama. Okay, what's that? that you shouldn't mix up olives and irons. That's probably a phonetic thing because they're graphically not very similar. Betin, kafin, kafin, betin. You shouldn't make cuffs bets or bets cuffs. So you need to make them distinguishable from one another. Daltin, reishin, reishin, daltin. Heyin, chetin, chetin, heyin. Bavin, yudin, yudin, bavin. And there's a couple of others, but you get the idea. So, by way of example, the manuscript here is dated variously, possibly between the 5th and 8th, 8th or 9th centuries. Um, it's old, is what. And it's a fragment of a Torah from the Karaganiza. And you can see here that the Chays do look an awful lot like Chets, and the Chafs do look an awful lot like Bets. The yuds, this yud here is suspiciously vavish. <coughs> Excuse me. So, in all scripts, those letters are fairly similar. So, the halacha just wants you to, when you're writing a Torah scroll, the early halacha wants you to take care to distinguish them so that your reader knows what, what you're writing. Other than that, it doesn't really care. By contrast, on the left here, there's a picture from the Likud Sifrei Stam, which many of us learn halacha from. And it's got there 13 different regions of the letter that it wants to say something particular about. So by the time you get to modernity, halacha has a lot to say about letter forms, but early halacha really doesn't care. And halacha not caring about letters, letter forms over much lasts well into the Middle Ages. So here we've got a couple of Torahs that have survived. One of them's, I think, 14th century, the other one's been carbon dated to the late 13th century. And there are all kinds of details here that just wouldn't pass today. 
if you sent me either of these as your work, I would say, go away and do it again. Right? There's this Torah, which has got its lines ruled with a uh, hard point. <clears throat> so it's got gray, gray ruled lines, which we don't do. Um, it's backed here, looks really very cuffy. There's not really enough space there, in all kinds of details. Um, and then over on the other Torah, this is the Bologna Torah, which is the oldest, presently the oldest verified known complete Torah, which is pretty awesome. Um, he joins up his haze, that's a thing, well into the Middle Ages. So a hay looks an awful lot like a chet does today. Um, his letters touch because that wasn't a big deal when this scribe was writing. Not particularly. You could still do that sort of thing. As, as long as you could read the word, that was what counted. So the whole aura of intense subversion in halachic details that we know today just wasn't always a thing. So that's the context in which we get this sort of thing. This is still the Bologna Torah from something like 1275. And it's delightfully full of modified letters and crazy tagging. This is a part of the, the passage which also appears in Mezuzot and it's more, more modified than most of the rest of this Torah. But it's striking this bit. I'm very fond of this bit. So you notice that it doesn't have regular Shatner's gets tagging that we normally used to. So shin here, I in here, no tagging on those. Just special tagging. Strangely shaped letters. But you can still read all the letters. There's no, there's no question as to what they are. And so that's fine. And then by the time that the letter halacha is, starts to develop, the modified letters, such as we see here, they're just a thing, they're part of the landscape. So halacha develops around these guys. So there's never really a question of, oh dear, is that kosher? Does the letter still have its proper form? Because those questions didn't even exist yet at the time these variations were being developed. So here's some background on the Shadnez gets tagging. So I'm assuming everybody knows what those are, but just in case, they're the ones that you get on the letters Shatnez gets on Shinayan and Tet and Zayan, Gimel Tzadi, the three ones that stick up on the top of their head. And the sources that we usually tie to those are Talmudic ones from Menachat Menachot on 29b, Amarav Yehuda, Amarav, when Rav Yehuda said that Rav said, when Moses ascended on high, he found the Holy One sitting and tying crowns onto the letters. He said to him, Holy One, what's holding you up? Kamadot, the Holy One said, one day there will be a man who will arise in the future after many generations, that Kiva ben Yosef Shemo, and Akiva ben Yosef will be his name. And he will pile upon each of these kutsim, each of these little bits, piles and piles of halachas. And then shortly afterwards in the same sugya, Amar Rabba, Shiba Otiyot Tzrichot Shloshat Ziyunin Ve'elohein Shat Nizgetz. Rabba said, seven letters require three Ziyunin each, and these are they, Shat Nizgetz. So, usually what we tell people is that the tagging on letters, either the Shat Nizgetz tagging or the modified tagging, depending on the context of the question you're being asked, that they represent these, this halachic exegesis. This, and you can make a whole beautiful, inspiring sermon about that. And people find it tremendously gorgeous. So it's not to be sneezed at, this explanation. 
The problem is it's not actually that simple. Um, and that Sugia actually is talking about something else, which I can go on about extensively another time. Um, but the Sugia has been retroactively interpreted to talk about graphical editions on letters. Um, Shatner's gets tag in as we know them become common only in the Middle Ages. You can see that from the manuscript evidence, the early Torah scrolls, there are not many Torah scrolls from the very early Middle Ages, even fragments. There's maybe a minion of Torah fragments from before the 11th century. Nonetheless, none of them have tagin of any sort. So not Shatner's gets tagin and not modified letters or special tagin. It's just in the Middle Ages that tagin start to appear on scrolls. The special ones first, and the Shatner's gets ones after. And I think, I argue with my PhD supervisor about this, but I think it happened around the same time Jews were starting to treat the Talmud a different way. They were starting to interpret the Talmudic text literally in a way that they hadn't before. The Jews' relationship to Talmud changed somewhat in the later Middle Ages. And at that point, we started to reinterpret this sugya as meaning, let's put Shatner's gets tag in on the letters. So the history is complicated, but the simple version is good and useful and inspiring. And when you're teaching people about tag in, use the simple version, don't make it complicated. What you do see once Shatner's gets tag in start coming, coming into, into existence is you see two sorts of tag in in manuscripts. So over here on the left is one, is a scroll that doesn't have Shadness Gets tag in at all, just special tag in. And then here's a couple of later scrolls. Now they've got Shadness Gets tag in and special tag in, but they still want you to know the difference. So the Shadness Gets tag in are these little insignificant, pushy little ones. They're there on the nuns, and the Zion and the Zion. But the special tag in a special, they're huge with the little eyeballs on sticks. And over here, here's a scroll from Ashkenaz. The difference here is less pronounced. It's a slightly later scroll, I believe. But the special tag in are huge. And the Shadnes Gets tag in are just fairly ordinary looking. Incidentally, you'll notice that these are three three sections from three different scrolls, and they all have special tagging on different letters. So, Norati Lot, one scroll has three tagging on the hay, one scroll has two tagging on the hay, one scroll has no tagging on the hay at all. They all agree about Aretz, very nice. And then the Ashkenazi scroll down here has another hay with three tagging that the other two don't have. So this is completely normal. Special tag in a wild and they're all over the place. There's very little agreement between scrolls, unlike the actual consonants where there's more or less consensus, less consensus than we might think. Contemporary post-medieval halacha starts with the Shulchan Arach. Arach 36. Most of us learn 32 reasonably thoroughly and then we get bored by the time we get to 36. But here's how 36 talks about tagging. So Shulchan Arach says, you've got to put tagging, by which he means little marks, on the Shadnes Getz letters. And the scribes have customs to tag other letters as well. But if you didn't do the tagging, even on Shatner's Gets, it's not possible. Okay, that's good to know. And here we see, all right, Shulchan Arach, talking about other tag, other tagging, what do you mean? Here's the Mishnah Brura commenting on that same piece of Shulchan Arach. If the scribe adds extra tagging other than shatniskets, 
וחוץ מאלה הוא מוזכר עם בתור ובלבוש. And other than those described by the Torah and the Lavush, Shinago Bahema Sofrim, Lake, that the scribes are accustomed to do, it didn't mess it up. Oh, what are these things that the Torah and the Lavush are describing? Hmm, we'll find out. Putting a pin in that thought, the Mishnah Bura goes on, Vilachatchila, en nachon lo sif tagin meats mo, koshilomus kabasof, was falling. So, it's not proper to add tagging off your own bat that aren't already described in some other source. So people were adding tagging off their own bats all the time. Um, we first have evidence of that from the Me'iri, who's much, much earlier, he's 13th century. And he says people just make stuff up all the time about this. So, and you can see it happening in later scrolls. I've been studying where people are putting otiot mishinot and special tagging in scrolls. And quite often they're just making half of it up. They've got something they think is interesting and they stick special tagging onto it. Um, and then of course we don't know why they put them there because they didn't trouble to write it down because you can't write it down in the Torah. So maybe they wrote down what they did in a notebook, but we don't have the notebook anymore. But people are making up tagging all the time and the Mishnah Burra says don't do that. Um, generally the Mishnah Burra on tagging is quite interesting and worth reading so I did a translation on Safaria for people so now you have no excuse. So you can go and look it up and read it in English or in Hebrew. So what were those tagging that the tour was describing? So turns out when you go hunting the tour quotes his father who's the Rosh uh, Rosh is late, late 13th century in Sephard, and the Rosh quotes this work called Shimusha Rabba. Shimusha Rabba is a text from the Gaonic era. The Gaonic era is a useful catch-all phrase, meaning after the Talmud and before the Rishonim, but we don't really have a clue when. It's sort of 500 years long. Um, but sometime between the... 7th, 6th, 7th and 12th centuries. You can't really tell, or at least I can't really tell. Um, anyway, it's in, it's in Babylonian Aramaic, so it's probably from Babylonia. And it talks about how to make tefillin. And one of the things he does is talk about making special tagging on letters in tefillin. And this is the earliest source that we have for doing special letters in any way onto fill in. There's also some special letters described in Merzechet Sofrim, there's some special letters described in a different work called Sefer Tage, but those are talking about Torahs, not to fill in. So Chimusha Rabba says that certain letters in fill in have certain numbers of tagging. He doesn't say why. And here are some of his tagging and some of other people's tagging. So the Shimusha Rabba, for instance, says that the bet of Yubiecha has three tagging. All right. These particular tefillin in this picture, these two other letters in Yubiecha also have three tagging. That crept in later. Shimusha Rabba is, is concerned about the resh and the memsofit of Hazchaim that they should have three tagging. Again here, the hay has also got some, that's a Rambam thing. Rechem has got some, don't know where that came from. So when you see tefillin that have special tagging, they, they've got all sorts of things. Some of them are described by the Shimusha Rabba, so in the tour. I didn't go and look at the Levush yet, so maybe some of these are in the Levush, I don't know. Some of them are described by the Rambam, some of them are later, don't know where, not my field of expertise. But you'll see to fill in with all of these wild tagging in them. And they're fine, they're allowed to be there. We don't know what they're doing there, but there they are. And they're all different. So if you're checking two pairs of to fill in and they've got different sets of special tagging, don't freak out. They're both just as valid as each other. You know, don't add any more in, preferably. So here's some letters from medieval Torah scrolls. 
And the lovely thing about the medieval Taurus cross is there's so much variation in the special tagging that you see. So there's Aleph with antenna on two sides. This one's got three and three and then two on his bottom foot. This one's just got two on his, on his yud part. This one's got four on his diagonal and three on his yud. And Dalits come with all kinds of numbers of tagging, two and three and four. And there's a hay with three tagging that should be sitting over there with the other hay with three tagging. And there's another hay with three tagging poking up and one, one tag poking down. Mirrored over here in this in this half, which has two up and one down. But his friend has three on his head. Both of those are ways of putting three tagging on letters in this period. And two tagging, one tag. Mem, there's all sorts of ways of putting tagging on. You can put the two any way you like. You can have four. He, he's got two little ones here and two crazy ones on his left hand side. There's this Mem Safit with two up and two down. There's a Samich here with two up and one down. And the way the one down is pointing, again, if you saw that to, today, you would think, ah, how can this possibly be a kosher Samich? But in the context of that scroll, it is a kosher Samich. It's just got this little pointy bit on him. And Sadi is unusually dull and is when it's adorned, it's almost always adorned with three and two, rarely anything else. Raish gets quite often this substantial spike, which really makes him look very much like a chet. So again, it's really important to remember that when that scroll was written, the kind of halachic thinking that says that's a chet just wasn't really in people's heads. So it doesn't look like the rest of the chets and then the scroll. It looks more like the raish is just with an adornment, so it's a raish. It's a different way of thinking. And then there's these different sorts of shins. There's an Ashkenazi one, two Sephardi ones, different quantities of tagging, and tav with different types of adornments as well. Tav tends to come with either tagging or this funny little flag thing at the top. Then there are Sometimes you might wonder, how do I tell the difference between something that's a special tag and something that's just a crazy wild serif? And the answer is, look at all the other letters. And that also applies just incidentally. I had to say this to someone this week. So when you're looking at a letter in a scroll and you think that looks funny, is this, is this okay? Compare it to the other letters in the scroll. So this dude always seems to do a crazy big serif on his aleph. So apparently that's just how he does aleph, okay. And he always does an enormous serif here on his bets. So that's how he does bet. But he doesn't always put four tagging on his hay and he doesn't always, take my word for this one, he doesn't always put a banner on his lamid. So looking at letters like that is very contextual. So that's just something to remember when you're looking at scrolls generally. More medieval scroll adornments. The pays are the famous ones that everybody seems to have heard about. And pay comes in two sorts of variations in the Middle Ages. There's pay with tagging, sometimes just on the head and sometimes on the head and on the foot, and the curly ones. And medieval curly pays are enormous. They, they're much, much, much bigger and they stand out way above the headline. So the other letters on this one are sort of one third the size. So those ones really stand out. You don't see that anymore. They calm down a bit, but they're quite striking. That's possibly part of why they're the ones people mention. And sometimes you get both. So you get curly pay with tagging. Very occasionally you get curly pay with crazy amounts of tagging. I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. They always tend to occur in the same place, but I don't know why yet. So check back about that. And here's some pace of feet and curly pace of feet. 
it looks weird. It wouldn't fly today. But in the Middle Ages, that was all right. And pace of feet with tagging. And over here, tet with curls. And tet with curls means something particular. Again, you mustn't just do tet with a curl because you think it's cute. And I didn't know that. And I did my first Torah with curled tet all the way through and the computer freaked out and the computer checker sent it back and you've got to fix all these. So yeah, they're only to be used on special occasions. But there are lots of different, here's two tet with curls from the same Torah, but one of them's got three and two and one of them's got two and three. It doesn't seem to matter to this scribe where he puts his tag in, particularly so long as he's got five. And as someone trained in modern halacha, that just seems weird, right? You think, how can it not matter where you've got the sticky outy bits? But it doesn't seem to. And we've got chet, which is modified with wiggly feet. It's a very technical term. You know, often Chet wiggles his foot over to the left. He, he looks like a Tav. What's with that? But it's definitely a Chet in the context. And there's Yud, which gets, sometimes Yud takes a crazy spike. Sometimes Yud curls round like a calf. Here's one with Yud that really looks mummish like a calf. So of course you don't see that in modern scrolls because a modern halachic reader just wouldn't be able to handle that, a yud that's built like a half, no. So you don't tend to get modified yud, certainly not in this form anymore. You sometimes see it, not very often. There's curly half of feet and half of feet with punky hair, and nun with curly toes. Just by the by, this one is an extended nun. You know, you can extend letters like hey and lamid and so on. So in the old days, you could extend none as well. To a modern reader, that looks very peculiar, but it was a thing people did. And <clears throat> some more, there's vav with three tagging. That's quite hard to pull off. Vav with curly bits, zion, sometimes with tagging in various quantities, zion with curly bits, this sign has gone completely bananas. Um, he is legit in a Torah scroll, but he's got this spike, this curl, and his shutness gets tag in just for good measure. That, that's a shape that you find in Ashkenaz. Apparently the Ashkenazim could deal with that. This guy in the middle here is a nun sofit, modified nun sofit. You wouldn't necessarily think it to look at it. Ayin takes all kinds of variations. Sometimes it's giving high five to Shemayim. Sometimes it's just curling crazily. Sometimes it's feet curl. There are Aramaic names for some of these shapes, but different halachists use the Aramaic names in different ways. So I tend to just use English words, since if you're choosing an Aramaic word, you're already interpreting. So you might as well just use English ones. And then you can use the Aramaic ones when you want to show off. So you can say, this is I in Tuluya. Ooh, that sounds very good. And Lamed does all these lovely, crazy things as well. He's Lamed with two tagging on his back. Lamed with two tagging, but they're on his neck now. Lamed with three tagging. And then Lamed with an extended nose in all sorts of different shapes. That seems to be more or less a regional thing. So there's lots and lots and lots of variations. So I just showed you like four screens of different ways of modifying letters. You seem to get more variation in Sephard than in Ashkenaz for some reason, but there's also lots of different opinions about which letters to modify. You saw that with the, the little three line quotes from Shirat Yam, and that's repeated through the whole Torah where you compare three different scrolls with modified letters. Some of them are gonna have certain common ones that do pretty much usually get modified, but there's gonna be tons that only happen in some scrolls or maybe a unique to one individual scroll. There's lots of variation. 
And this makes sense when you think about it because it's hard to transmit this kind of, this, this kind of detail, right? Tug in a tiny. So if you don't have brilliant eyesight, then hard to see. There's no obvious logic to them. So you can't pick up on spelling mistakes like you can with the consonants. <clears throat> There's no rule. So it's not like you put tug in on all the shins. You put special tag in on some shins. Which shins? There isn't a good rule for it. Um, the Rambam says that too, by the by, that there's there's absolutely no pattern or logic to these things. So I imagine if the Rambam had been able to put in that that texty thing, that's like mm? he would have at that point. Um, so that's partly why you get tons of variation. So that's just an interesting thing to notice. And later halachists basically give up on them. Rambam says the special tag in, nice if you can, don't worry about them, don't sweat it. And so other halachists breathe a sigh of relief and follow him basically saying, never mind about it, just don't worry, just get the consonants in place. Except the Yemenites. The Yemenites hang on to their special letters. So the Yemenites do faithfully reproduce their tradition modified letters. And good for the Yemenites. Um, the rest of us kind of making up as we go along because it's very, there are very varied patterns of where to put the special letters, even in Tefillin, even in Mezuzah. There's a handful of different ways of doing it that you find even in the Tikkunim. There's, this combines with a trend towards halachic thinking in defining the letter forms. So if this thing has the form of a chet, if it has a flat bit across the top and two legs, that makes it a chet. And it becomes now less acceptable to think of, oh, this is a reish with a pointy bit of its nose. If it ticks all the boxes for a chet, it's a chet, end of story. So that's a trend in halachic thinking that grows over the course of late medieval and early modern Judaism. And this is combined with how do you transmit special letters and tag in in printing? Early printing technology just doesn't do that. Early printing of Hebrew script has enough trouble incorporating vowels it doesn't want to bother with special letters. So the special letters don't make it into the printed traditions by and large. So they get lost there. And all of these things mean that the special letters and the funny tagging are mostly being transmitted from person to person. So you get a tikkun and it's got them in it. And that gets very easily disrupted when you have pogroms and people being killed and people being displaced and the Shah you can really see if you've run into the Westminster Scrolls the Westminster Scrolls were collected up by Nazis and many of them have modified letters in them the early modern ones from the 17th 18th 19th centuries and that tradition was just completely um, wiped out. And it's really on, only lately that people have started to have an interest again in writing scrolls with modified letters. So what tradition there was of writing modified letters in scrolls, and it wasn't universal by any means, um, really died out over time. We do get some, some, some use of, of modified letters and special tagging in different scrolls, even today, and you will find them. Um, just in, in modern times, they're a little bit different. Um, so I'm gonna sidetrack the dots on the letters. Don't get mixed up with that. Dots are always in Torahs on, in certain places. And they don't always look the same, but they're generally there. And if you haven't got the dots, then you should have the dots. And if you find the dots, don't freak out and erase them because they're supposed to be there. There are different traditions. So sometimes the dots are round, sometimes they're sort of diamondy, sometimes they've got 
little commas on the end. Sometimes they look like little bombs. Um, dots are their own thing. They don't worry about those. And then when you get into, into early modern scrolls, usually the Westminster scrolls, if you've got a, scroll, if you've got a com community that's holding a scroll from the Westminster Trust, then often you'll find lovely modified letters. They're not quite the same as the medieval ones anymore. The modern ones, they do use special tagging. They tend not to make them graphically all that different from the ordinary tagging. Sometimes there are more of them. It's, I think on the principle that we've got one scroll that has them on the Rish and one scroll that has them on the Aleph. Which one is the right answer? I don't know. Let's put them in on both. So the sort of maximalist approach to include all the possibilities. Modern ones tend to be a bit more delicate in formation. So a modified Vav in modern scrolls, early modern scrolls, I mean, up through the 19th century at any rate, tend to have much more delicate tendrils on them, as opposed to the big chunky things that the medieval ones had. And the tradition tended to survive more in the Czech scrolls than others, so you have less variance just because you have less regional variance at the root. Um, you still have the chet with wiggly feet, you still have the curly pays, curly pays of feet with a beard. Iron still makes its high five to Shemayim and it has, still has curls. There's an innovation of Sadi reaching up above the headline of the script, which is curious. I don't know where that came in, but that's exclusively modern. So these are all things that you'll find if you look carefully. And there are scribes having fun. So on this Yoshev here, that's just because he's got some space. He's enjoying himself and, and, and embellishing his tagging. And there's this lovely Tzitzhav where he's got the big study in Tzitz, which you don't always see. And then on, on the Zion of Zahav, his, his shatnas gets tagging and they have the form of Zions. And because they're Zions, they have tagging. So you can just imagine them proceeding fractally on forever. I don't know why he chose to do it at that particular point. Perhaps there was a reason, but it's cute. But I think it's just him having fun more than anything. Over here with He Anan, got a lovely rainbow of tagging and I think again that's just him having fun because it's satisfying putting Shatner's gets tagging on three heads close together like that. It's fun and quite often you see tagging in a rainbow like that so here he is having a bit more fun. And then over here right at the end of the Torah these irons have gone very emphatic and the Lamids with their great big banners and they're, they're, they're taking up a lot of space there and being very bold-faced because it's the end of the Torah and the scribe is, here we are, we did it. So sometimes when you see embellishments, it's just scribes having fun and sometimes it's tradition. Sometimes good luck telling the difference. And then if you decide that you want to put these into your, into your scrolls, then your Likut Sifre Stam, which you've probably got, has a bunch of tikkunim in it for the tagging in tefillin and muzizot. And then there's this other book, which is Sefer Tage, Sefer Tagin, relatively recent publication. It's a good start for putting tagging into your Torahs at any rate. It's not the last word on the subject, but it's not bad. And it has a whole list of every verse in the Torah, which potentially has a modified letter and the way that the author of this book thinks you should modify it. So if you want to do that, here's a way you can do it. And it's also quite good fun. Or you can just copy a scroll. If you've got access to a scroll that has modified letters, go through it, write down where they are and copy them and preserve that tradition. So, and yeah, so go away and do that because it's fun. That's what I've got to say. I'm gonna keep recording, but if anybody has anything that they want to chime in about, now would be a good time.
So is the scroll kosher if it has no tugging? Oh yeah. Yeah. Ideally you have tugging, but but if if you couldn't do it. No, you didn't do it. That's in the Rambam and it's it's also in, in the Mishnah Brewer that you can go and read on Safari. Yeah. It's nice to do it. It's a bit rubbish to leave them off. Jen, when did the when did when did Sofrim pretty much stop using the 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 curl cues, the the odd tug in the um, as at least as a as a regular pro, uh, uh, practice? I think it was never uniform. Like I think it was it was never widespread, widespread. Um, but people seem to stop doing it towards the well around the end of the middle ages i think it, i think printing has something to do with it um and then it flares up again in europe in early modern the gra is super into them and and of course the yemenites never stopped doing them but the yemenite tradition isn't quite as wild and and varied as the european one is just more constant Okay. And then it really, it really dies out in Europe with the Shoah and then starts to come back slowly afterwards in the past 20 years or so, I guess. Okay. Are you going to be able, are you, uh, can you share us the, these, uh, these screens? Yes. Um, Can I share a file on Zoom? This is the bit where I... Even if it's not on Zoom. Yeah, I can definitely... Well, I will figure out where to where we're putting the recording and I'll put the recording next to the slides and then I will email the group and let you all know where it is. It's okay. Probably easiest. Is there a date after which, say, mid 19th century um, where you would not expect to see Sifre Torah with the, with say Ashkenazi Torahs uh, that don't have them. I, I've seen, the reason I'm asking is that I've seen some scrolls that have these Otiot Mishunot uh, mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't know that they are I don't, I don't know how old they are. It seems to me that they are not, um, say, older than the late 19th century. But could they be? Seems reasonable. Okay. I think it's a relatively, where it's done, it's not done in a lot of places, but where it is done, I think it's done relatively, relatively consistently up until those communities stop existing. I see. Okay. I I think Ethan would know more about that than I would because Ethan's area of expertise is modern scrolls and mine is um, medieval scrolls. So right. I, mean, I, don't I, really know. I, I agree, first of all, that it seems to die out in different places at different times over time. Um, uh, again, this is, I don't have data on this, but it's only my overall impression, which is I think the same as yours that through the middle of the 19th century, people are still doing it towards the end of the 19th century. You don't see it that much. Um, and I think, I think the Shoah is kind of the nail in the coffin. Anywhere that was still possibly doing it, stopped doing it. But I, I, I've seen scrolls that I, again, I'm not an expert in dating, but I think they're early 20th century and they don't have them. Um, okay. so yeah, so it becomes less of a thing question. as time goes on. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, if, if you're placing a scroll in the, in the 19th century for other reasons and it's got Otio Mishunot, that's not a deal breaker. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, that's about all I've got to say about that. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. And thank you, Haley, for sharing the Zoom. My and pleasure. Stop the sharing and let's stop this recording. Thank you.
Okay.